and we're kind of fooling around here as a teacher. What's the gist? Don't worry, you've only got like what, 12 more weeks of this class. So 12, maybe 13. You can make it. I got confidence. Okay, so we ended class a long time ago in a galaxy not too far away from us. Um, talking about supply. And we talked about what are the things that determine our willingness and ability to produce. That would be the price of the inputs, the ingredients, the egg, sugar, flour, vanilla extract. The cost of the land, labor, capital, and knowledge. Um, if you want to become a computer programmer, well, where are you going to do it? I can do it in my basement. Good. Uh, who's going to do the labor? Me. Good. Tools and equipment? I already got a computer. Good. Well, what's it going to cost you for getting the college education you need to become a computer programmer? That's something. Yeah, that's that, that's what you got to think of. Just it, it's usually we think of the tools, equipment, and the labor are going to be the expensive things. But sometimes knowledge is going to be the expensive thing. But you got to think about if you don't already have the knowledge, what is it going to cost you to get the knowledge that you need? Maybe it's you getting an education. Maybe it's you doing research and development, testing things, experimenting with things, trying things out. That's part of it. What technology is available? What new technology might be coming along? Uh, which what might be coming along would be expectations, right? Um, other goods, taxes and subsidies, any help you can get from the government, any extra taxes that the government's going to penalize you with, and the number of sellers. That's kind of where the smart board is not responding at all today. Oh, that's going to hurt. Hmm? It's twice hard. Um, now it's where this computer got rebooted and it just, it doesn't. Okay. Okay. So then uh, we didn't, okay. Get to this. So just like our tastes and preferences as humans change, just as our income changes and that changes our demand for products, well, those determinants of supply, they also change. The price of ovens gets cheaper. The price of bulldozers gets cheaper or more expensive. The price of gasoline gets cheaper or more expensive. The price of eggs and sugar and vanilla extract, they may get cheaper, they get more expensive. And in, in those cases, that makes it either easier or harder to produce, right? So that ends up shifting your supply curve. Just like the determinants of demand shifted your demand curve, any change in the determinants of supply will shift your supply curve to an all new curve. And so naturally, guess what? It can go out to the right. It's more expensive. It's harder to do. If it's harder to produce, oh, no, excuse me. If it's shifting out to the right, it's easier to do. For the same money, I can do more. I get more education so I can do more work. I, it's cheaper to buy a bulldozer so I can get two of them and do twice the work. I can, instead of getting a bolt axe rifle, I can get a machine gun so I can assassinate that many more chickens. Right? I'm a chicken assassin, that's the job, right? If it becomes cheaper, it becomes easier to produce, supply is gonna increase. Supply curve is gonna shift out, more people would be able to do it. The supply of watermelon shifted out when they came up with that technology that would allow Sam to say computer watermelon and they magically appear and he never has to touch them, right? Remember that example from a week ago? Yeah, so that allowed Sam to be making watermelons that way right alongside the rest of y'all that were making watermelons the old-fashioned way, right? Taking female watermelon and male watermelon and putting them together with a little berry white music and that's not... Jesus. Oh. <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry, apparently it's going to be one of those days. So I'm going to say the over-under on me touching the board is going to be 10 times. So there we go. Uh, of course, if things get harder, if it's harder to produce, more costly to produce, that's going to shift the supply curve back to the left. Which means we can't produce as much. We're not interested in producing as much. We're not willing to produce as much because it gets harder for us to do. Okay. 
I have an example, but I'm going to hold on to that one for a little bit. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. Good. So here's the fun thing. Equilibrium. Don't read this. When have you ever heard the word equilibrium in your life? Um, chemistry. Yeah, chemistry. Really? Chemistry? Yeah. Not how, biology? Biology. What were they talking about in biology? The word I'm looking for is balance. Because oh, if you lose your equilibrium, you get dizzy, you lose your equilibrium, your head ain't right, and then you lose your balance. That's why when you get an ear infection, you start staggering around and you're dizzy because your body uses the ear to help you to maintain the hey, I'm level versus I ain't level kind of thing. So if you so apparently none of you are biology majors, so that will take the word equilibrium and get balance, and you've got it. That will name your trick won't help you. But equilibrium is a market clearing balance. When we made a graph of demand, we had price on y-axis, we had the product on x-axis. When we made the graph of supply, we had price on the y-axis, we had the product on the x-axis. So the two graphs can be put together. Somewhere along the line, supply and demand have to meet. Remember our definition market, where supply and demand meet. Suppliers and demanders meet. And so what we end up getting is there ends up being a balance between the amount of watermelons that the watermelon growers is going to grow is going to find balance compared to the amount of watermelons the watermelon eaters are going to eat. Because if watermelon eaters don't eat as many watermelons as they're growing, what's going to happen next year? They ain't going to grow as many, right? And so they're going to try to grow the amount of watermelons to equal out to the amount that we eat. Because to grow more than that is a waste. To grow less than that is what? Yeah, a lost opportunity. I could sell more watermelons to more suckers if only we would grow more, right? Because you got people standing at the door saying, give me watermelon or give me death, right? Channeling their eater, Patrick Henry. Yes. So the equilibrium, that is the price where the quality, the quantity that the suppliers are making is equal to the quantity that we, the customers, are buying. So visually, it's going to be beautiful when we get to the very next slide. And I'm not going to touch the board. This is what it looks like visually. Where our demand curve and our supply curve meet. At this price, of course, my board fails only on the days when I want to draw on the sinking board. Let me drop something. Come on, let's see. I'm drawing on the other screen. Okay. How do I? See if I can remember how I broke that last time. Unbroke it? No, breaking it is the thing. I got to kill this one piece of software and then it will let the other do its thing. I know this is great TV for those of y'all following along at home. That ain't the right screen. Okay, at this price, that I call PE, little E means equilibrium, just going on, because I had to call it something. At this price, the amount that, just look at the supply curve, ignore the demand curve. At this price, this is how much we as customers are wanting to eat, right? Now look at the supply curve. At this price, this is how much they as producers are wanting to produce. And it's the same amount. See that? What happens up here? We only, as customers, only want to buy, I'm sorry for those y'all on the internet, we only want to buy a little bit, right? But they're looking to sell at that price a bunch. So they're making a bunch, 
and selling a few. We have a word for that. <laughs> Surplus. Down here, at this point, at this lower price, they ain't wanting to make a whole lot. They can't afford to make a whole lot. But what happens? That price is low. We want a bunch. So we have a word for that. Shortage. I've got slides for all of this. But that's what we're doing. If you got a shortage, if you got customers saying, we want more, we want more, we want more, either you or somebody else is going to give them more, right? If you or find yourself in a situation where you got too much and the customers are like, we ain't buying, we ain't buying, we ain't buying, well, a couple things can happen. Number one, you're gonna cut back your production. And what else are you gonna do? You can lower your price. Think about the bakery. You bake a bunch of cakes and you don't sell them yet to yesterday, so here's today, what are you gonna do? You got some day old bread and day old cakes, what are you gonna do? Half off, right, to try to get them suckers out of there. And are you gonna bake the same number today as you did yesterday? No, you're going to adjust, right? So you, the market is gonna to tend to go toward an equilibrium, and that's why we talk about it. The surplus, okay, would be the situation where the amount that they make is bigger than the amount that we buy. And the reason is because the price is too high. The price is so high, so we're like, nah, we ain't gonna buy what y'all are selling. Kind of like the not brand new iPhones. I mean, seriously? Yeah. Woo! But um, luckily for them, there's a bunch of people that are gonna pay 11, 12, $1,300 for, $1, for an iPhone. It must be nice, but. <laughs> Anyway, but the surplus, the amount, the price is high enough that we don't want to buy as much as they're producing. Because it's the price, you know, we think we can sell for this high price, and so we base our production accordingly. Uh, I don't know if I'm getting Connor mixed up with a guy, Tristan, and my other class. Garcia soybeans, is that Connor in this class? Anyway, okay, dude, well, I've got, I have a student somewhere that teach that their family is growing soybeans. And they grew soybeans expecting the price to be high. But they, because they got a plant in the spring for what they're going to be harvesting in the fall, and they think they're so, their, their judgment on, well, we're going to grow soybeans instead of corn is based on, well, I think this is what the price of soybeans is that we're going to get. Well, what happens? Well, maybe, okay, if the price, so you got to make these production decisions based on what you think the price is going to be. In the case of a surplus, they think the price is high, so they crank out a bunch of it, but we as customers say, we don't want it. We think that the price that they were expecting was too high, but they based their production accordingly. Right. So visually speaking, the surplus is just for you visual learners, for you non-visual learners, don't panic. But we kind of looked at this already. At the higher price, we don't want to buy as many. The quantity that we demand, the number that we want, we only want, I'm gonna make up numbers. Let's say that the price, the equilibrium price is like $5. But they were charging 10, they should have charged five. If they're charging 10, well, instead of buying 50,000 things, we're only buying 20,000 of the things, but where they thought that they could produce 50,000, uh, they thought they could sell these suckers for $10 piece, they're making 100,000 of them. I wish I could write the numbers on there. <laughs> they thought we can get ten dollars a piece, so let's make a hundred thousand of them. But in reality, at ten dollars a piece, we're only buying twenty thousand of them, so they're left with eighty thousand surplus, right? So what are they going to do? Well, we got these leftover cakes, leftover cookies, leftover whatever. So okay, yeah, we made them. Let's open up the back door and throw them out in the backyard and let the vultures or whatever squirrels, whatever, eat it. What? No, the first thing they're going to do, they're going to lower the price, right? So they're going to experiment. We're going to lower the price. And we ain't going to make as much tomorrow. And then tomorrow, if we see, okay, we went from $10 to $9, so we didn't make as much, and we sell some of this other junk, but we still have leftover. Well, okay, we didn't do it. We lower our price even more, and we produce even less, right? And you're going to keep going because to overproduce is to make stuff that you ain't selling and that is wasteful. Especially if it's something that, like, you know, that 
is a perishable item that's only got a short shelf life and then you got to throw it out back to feed it to the squirrels. Give the squirrels E. coli or whatever they get. A shortage, that's when the amount that we want as customers is greater than the amount that they make. And that generally happens because the price is seen as being too low. Maybe it's a fair price to us, but it apparently isn't as, low, as high as a company can get away with charging. This would be the situation of South Hill Donut Shops sells their donuts for a dollar a piece and they sell out at 10 o'clock every day. So you got people going over there at 11 o'clock in the morning, give me donut or give me death, banging on the door, banging on the door. What is the South Hill Donut Shop going to do? I think I stand there, pull back the sign, and middle finger in the air, go away, come back tomorrow. You like, no. What are they going to do? They're going to, A, they're going to say, well, let's see if we can make more. Well, it costs us more to make more, apparently, or else we'd already be making more. We've got to hire more workers, buy more ovens, buy more delivery trucks, buy more refrigerators. So what are we going to have to do if we're going to make more donuts? Spend more, which means we're going to have to raise our prices. So the price is going to go up. It's going to kind of have to go up so we can afford to increase our production. Which means, okay, so maybe we go from making 100 donuts a day to making 130 donuts a day, so that's 30 more, but we're selling them for more money. Maybe we don't run out until 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. But it's a little bit of the, let's, let's, let's raise our price up and find out who wants them the most. We raise our price to $2 a donut, and we don't sell out, well then apparently $2 is high. It was too high. But that's what we need to increase our production. So you, they're gonna start experimenting with raising their prices, find out, okay, well we got so many people banging the door for our donuts, more than we can afford to make, well we're gonna sell our donuts to the people that want them the most, that are willing to pay the most. So the price is going to go up. If, so if a company's charging too low of a price, they're going to raise it. If a company is charging too high of a price, they're going to lower it. Because otherwise, they're going to be overproducing and throwing a bunch of crap away, or they're going to be underproducing. Well, is it an underproducing a problem? Did South Hill Donut Shop selling out at 10 o'clock in the morning and shutting the doors? Not necessarily. It might be an inconvenience for a customer. Yeah. They're not maximizing their profit. They're not maximizing their profit. And why do we talk about three weeks ago, one, one of the reasons for starting a business to maximize profit, make the most money profit, so they're missing out on opportunity. They don't meet the customer's demands by, oh, we're gonna raise our price and make more donuts. What's gonna happen, what are they asking for? Okay. Begins with letter C, ends with the word competition. They're asking for competition. If the South Hill Donut Shop isn't going to meet this excess pent-up demand of people marching saying, give me donut, give me death, give me donut, give me death. And then you got a weird wacko, wacko, wacko give me donut and give me death. Right. But, you know, there should be somebody like Allison that she could be riding up the street and she's like, every day I come riding up there like 10, 10, 30 in the morning or whatever and I see all these people out there with the signs and torches and pitchforks and all that stuff saying, give me donut or give me death. And she's going to be like, hmm, I wonder if there's an opportunity there. Okay, there's a second opportunity. <laughs> okay, if she's suicidal, opportunity. If she wants money, opportunity. But she's like, well, maybe I can't afford to make donuts to sell them for a dollar a piece. Well, what if the best she can do is a buck fifty? Well, guess what? The first people, the first hundred people are going to go to South Hill Donut Shop and buy the dollar donuts and then walk away. And then what happens to those other suckers that didn't show up until after 10 o'clock? Well, they can either buy her dollar and fifty donut, or they can walk away empty-handed. So it's kind of hard for you to be chanting "Give me donut and give me death" when Allison's standing over there saying, "I got you donuts, only about fifty, right?" <laughs> so it still is an opportunity if you have excess demand and you don't meet that demand, somebody else will. I promise you, somebody else will. So that's why companies are always on the lookout to see what they have to do to prevent competition from coming in there. If there's excess demand, they're going to adjust. They will raise their price if they have to, 
they will increase production as they can because they don't want to let that opportunity, because ooh, get this house in donut shop. And then Allison comes along and she raised their prices to buck fifty. And South Hill Donut Shop is like, dude, people are willing to pay buck fifty for donuts. How stupid are we selling them for only dollars? Or what might they do? Right. Raise your price to a buck fifty. So they're up to buck fifty. Allison's up to buck fifty, and Allison's like, man. But what if it turns out that when it does sell, the people decide they like Allison's donuts better than the South Hill Donut Shop's donuts, right? So they're a buck fifty. They're a buck fifty. People are still going to be going to Alice's, and they're going to be starting to go to her shop first. And then the only time anybody's going to go to South Hill Donut Shop is after she sells out. If she sells out, how ugly of a situation is that for the South Hill Donut Shop? Very stinking ugly. So what's the safest thing for the South Hill Donut Shop to do? Keep her from going in business in the first place. And that doesn't mean for them to hire a couple of mafia people with the middle name of V, like Jimmy V Squirrel, Mac V Knight, right? <laughs> you know, to be going up there and like sort of like threatening to break your legs or sort of, gee, Allison, it would be a shame if your dog died while you were in your donut shop today. And accidents do happen. <laughs> so <laughs> instead, they keep her from going in business by saying, well, we've got customers lined up at the door. They really, really, really want our donuts. So let's raise our price a little bit and see how bad they want them. Right. You, ha you have to adapt to your look at your customers, do that research, see what they're doing, and you have to adapt. Otherwise, if your price is too high, you're asking for problems. If your price is too low, you're asking for problems. You need to get your price where your price needs to be. And that's why we call it an equilibrium. You achieve a balance. Okay, visually speaking. This is the situation. This, in this case, the price is too low. They can't afford to make a whole lot of it. Oops. Oh, oh dude, I'm sorry. You get click happy. Uh, in this case, the price is so low, they're not willing to produce a whole lot of it. But we, the customers, are banging on the door saying, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme donut, gimme this price. So either they have to increase their prices so they can get the money to buy more tools, equipment, so they can increase their production, or somebody else is going to do that for them, named Allison, right? You go, girl. Does that make sense to you? Now, here's the fun thing. Flashback for you history majors, if this thing will quit popping up. These adjustments are going to happen automatically. Without government intervention, it isn't needed. Nobody needs to tell South Hill Donut Shop, well, gee, if you're selling out at 10 o'clock in the morning, you really need to raise the prices. They're going to figure it out on their own. Or somebody like Allison is going to figure it out and take advantage of it, right? It's not going to take the soybean producer or whoever a long time to figure out, hey, uh, we're overproducing. We need to cut back production and lower our prices so we can quit throwing, growing stuff that we don't need to grow and throwing it away. They'll figure it out automatically. Government interference isn't necessary. The equilibrium, the market moves as if moved by an invisible hand, quote unquote. That, the idea of the invisible hand comes from a guy named Adam Smith who wrote a book, The Wealth of Nations. Does that ring any bells to any of you? Okay, yeah, what? You've heard of it. The Wealth of Nations. You heard of it in history class. When did Adam Smith write the Wealth, the wealth of Nations? When was it published? 1776. What was going on in 1776? Oh, the Revolutionary War. What were we doing? We're standing at the East Coast, middle fingers in the air, saying, British government, we don't need you sticking your nose in our business. Right? Don't, you don't need to be telling us what to do with our daily lives and taxing us with our representation. You don't need to be doing this kind of stuff. Less government is what we need. Let us do our thing. And Adam Smith, Invisible Hand, whatever, it's kind of some of the economic underpinnings of the American Revolution. Yeah, we don't need the British government doing their stuff and housing their soldiers and our houses and all that kind of stuff. And hey, well, we don't need them telling us what prices we need to charge because <laughs> If we're overproducing, we'll fix it. If we're underproducing, we'll fix it. If our prices are too high or our prices are too low, those adjustments are going to happen 
We don't need the government getting it all. So there's your history lesson for the day. Like I didn't say I never know standing history class. Go with me. Um, let me, okay, let me go back in. Anybody have a problem with a surplus? The word wasteful comes to my mind. What are you doing? You're making more than you can sell. That means you're paying workers that you don't need to make stuff that you don't need, and then you end up throwing it away. You're trying to grow stuff that doesn't need to be grown on land that it probably doesn't need to be grown on, and you're spending all the extra money on fertilizer and that kind of stuff that's getting washed down into the rivers and that kind of stuff. You know, getting carried away with surplus is bad for the environment. It's bad for your pocketbook. Surpluses are a problem. Just if you're, if you're, I'm pro environment. I love the environment. You want the markets to be getting toward the equilibrium. You want markets to be finding a balance because otherwise you're wasting resources. If you're doing a surplus. You're, Is that food only? Is that food? Well, that's everything. If you're making car. You're making cars that nobody's going to buy. And then you're going to turn them into scrap metal. So you spend all that time and effort and energy and whatever nuclear power and stuff to make the things and then they're just gonna get wadded up and thrown away or shot into outer space. Your name is Elon Musk. Oh. Yeah. The shortage, that's just opportunity lost. Don't live a life with regret. So, are y'all with me on all of that? Okay. So, here we go. There are times in your life where those determinants of demand changes. There are times in your life where those determinants of supply changes. So now that we've put supply and demand together, well, when those changes happen, what happens to the market? That's what we're going to be. The equilibrium is going to change in each of these situations here. So we've got, bless you, we have four scenarios that we're going to look at. The first one is a increase in demand. Yes. Will there ever be a scenario where there is absolutely no equilibrium? Or would that just be impossible? <laughs> Technically, maybe in the forms of we're going to build something and hope that then some suckers out there wanting to buy it and well, no, it's going to work out to zero. We're going to make something hoping people will buy it and then they don't end up buying it. And so the equilibrium should be down to zero. And well, I'm going to stop producing. So I'm going to get there. I overproduced for the however long it goes away. So you're going to get some kind of equilibrium. Uh, now, the government could screw that up, which we'll get to at some point. Uh, did we talk about price floors or price ceilings in here? Okay, that's my marketing <laughs> class. Okay, the government could screw this up and break the equilibrium. But what did we just say? The equilibrium is good. Because if you don't have the equilibrium, if you're not at equilibrium, you're either making stuff that doesn't need to be made or you're not making stuff that does need to be made, right? Let's just put it that simple. You're making stuff that doesn't need to be made or you're not making stuff that does need to be made. So at the equilibrium, you're making all that is needed and only what is needed. If we're only going to eat, if we're going to eat 50,000 donuts, they're going to make all 50,000 we're going to eat, and they're only going to make the 50,000. They're gonna, not going to make more of them and throw them away, right? So if you're not at equilibrium, you're being inefficient. You're breaking things, and the government will sometimes come in and break things, and we will get to that slightly, well, they will get to that Thursday. But to not have an equilibrium, no. The equilibrium will be there, but maybe it gets ignored. So in this case, we have a demand increase. Let's talk about a, a product. Give me a product. Pepsi. Pepsi? OK. And let's see. OK. News comes out tomorrow. You open a newspaper. Y'all ever read a newspaper? 
okay, no, okay. The, 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 the girl comes home from college one weekend and she's sitting there with her father at this breakfast table and they're like eating breakfast. And the father looks at the daughter and he's like, can you, uh, honey, can you hand me the newspaper? She's like, Dad, people don't use newspapers anymore. Here, take my iPad. So he takes the iPad and wham, kills the fly with it. <laughs> That's why I ask you all for jokes. Okay. So, you open up the newspaper tomorrow morning and you read that there's true scientific research, without a doubt, drinking Pepsi will increase your IQ, make you faster, make you stronger, make you smell better, and there. Yes. So, what are you going to say? Yes. You prefer to drink things that will make you better than to drink things that will like make you worse, right? What are we gonna do? We're gonna want more Pepsi, right? Even some of y'all that don't like Pepsi, I don't like the taste of it, but dude, I'm gonna be drinking me a little bit of Pepsi, right? So the demand for Pepsi is gonna increase. No matter what the price is, we're gonna drink more than we would have before because Pepsi's doing more than just quenching our thirst. It is quenching our thirst, making it stronger, better, faster, smarter, etc. Okay, that's only number one, right? Since I started counting, no, that's four. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think that the first one's counted because I didn't know the board was broken. But okay, so I think, well, in that case, it's still two. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in this case, what happens? Demand increases. Demand shifts to the right. We have a brand new demand curve. The old one, the blue one, doesn't exist anymore because we're in a whole new reality. And if I was smart, I would make it to where that one disappeared. So what ends up happening? Supply didn't change. Okay, Pepsi makes people smarter. Did that change the price of water? No. Did that change the price of sugar? No. Did that change the price of gasoline? No. So Pepsi's costs to produce didn't change. So their supply curve doesn't change. Their supply curve stays the way it is, but the way you and I think about Pepsi has improved. We want more Pepsi, so the demand curve is the only thing that changes here. And so we end up with this new equilibrium point and what's going on there. We're going to drink more Pepsi and the price is going to go up. A, because they have to raise the price in order to be able to produce the more Pepsi that we want. And B, well, because they can get away with it. I.e. Apple and your same iPhone, right? So the price will go up and we're going to drink more. They're going to have to raise the price in order to increase production. Right. And maybe they overly increase the price to buy them some time to where they can you know, get the money, whatever they need in order to increase production. So the price may really go up and then it'll come down after a few months, but it's going to end up settling out at a newer, higher price. So we're going to drink more, we're going to pay more for Pepsi, and we're okay with that because Pepsi does more, right? We're not just getting a thirst quencher anymore. Right. So you get a brand new equilibrium point. Don't worry, I have a, sli a slide thing that summarizes all of these. And I'm not going to make you do the graphing on the test, but if you are like me and can't memorize, I will give you a blank supply and demand curve on a test that, that you can work with and play with, figure things out, because that's the way I have to do it. I don't have this stuff memorized. Teacher, you don't know this stuff? Yes. That should be fairly obvious for weeks into the semester. Okay, alternate universe number one. Spock is the captain of the Enterprise. Uh, demand decreases. You open up the newspaper, and instead of the news saying Pepsi makes you stronger, faster, better looking, whatever, instead, alternate universe, you open the newspaper and it says drinking Pepsi will cause your lips to fall off. Yes. Oh, no. Is, it, is this a supply issue or a demand issue? This is a demand issue. It, the price of water, the price of sugar, the price of whatever didn't change. This is a demand thing. And so what happened? It, does that make us want more Pepsi or less Pepsi? Unless you make Jagger and you think you got more lips than you need. Otherwise, y'all are too young to know who he is. Uh, otherwise, just see, uh, oh, okay, and Steven Tyler, y'all might know him, but okay. Just... Um, otherwise, we want less Pepsi than we did before because we're not as interested in drinking it if it's going to kill us. 
there's a thirst, thirst quencher and liver ripper, right? So what are those two is not so good. So what happens in that case? Demand is going to decrease. It's going to shift back to the left. We don't want to buy as much. So this new equilibrium point has us buying less. And the price is going to get lower. The price is going to get lower. Why? <laughs> yeah, but why does that mean they end up lowering their price? Why not just leave the price exactly the same? They may end up with a surplus if they don't lower their price. The other thing is, well, maybe they're trying to stop the bleeding. You know, we're losing customers left and right. People are, I ain't gonna drink Pepsi if you gonna rip my lips off. Oh, but I can get it for 75 cents? Hmm, maybe. <laughs> maybe I'll take my chances if I can get it for a quarter a piece, but I ain't gonna do it for a dollar. But if I can get it for a quarter a piece, oh, let's see what happens. All right? There is that thinking there. When some, some money is better than no money. So a lot of times you may have to lower your price to keep from losing customers in the face of an ugly situation. When the recession hit in 2008, 2009, unemployment rates are going up to 12%. One out of every eight workers is out of work. So these companies aren't making money. So they're like, well, if we lower our price, maybe people will keep buying our product and maybe instead of making a lot of profit, we'll only make a little bit of profit or instead of making profit, well, we'll get some money to help us pay our own bills so we don't have to shut down. Lowering your price when you're losing customers is a strategy that you pretty much are going to have to do. If your customers are leaving, if the South Hill Donut Shop is losing all the customers to Allison when they raise their price to a buck and a half and nobody's coming in their store again, well, what can they do? Lower their price down to a buck and a quarter. And maybe some of those people come back, lower their price back down to the dollar where it was before. Maybe people will come back, right? So they're going to lower their price. Now also they'll be able to lower their price because well, we don't, we ain't making as many bottles of soda because we ain't making as many sodas. We ain't selling as many sodas. And I know I shouldn't be using ink, but okay. Uh, so we don't need as many workers. We don't need as many delivery trucks, right? So we can get rid of those old busted about to explode delivery trucks that are like 35 years old and stuff. We can get rid of those. We can get rid of those workers that are kind of like Preston, that they're like stoners, that kind of stuff, and maybe only work two legitimate real hours a week when we have them on the job. We can get rid of some of those kind of people, right? So they will end up being able to trim down, lower their expenses, and that's going to let them lower their price. And they're going to kind of have to lower their price to, to keep the customers from going away. No, supply, stay the same. The cost of sugar is the same. The cost of water is the same. They're just moving to a different point on that same supply curve. They're making less following the same supply curve they had before. They're making less, but on that same supply curve that they had before. Good question. Did y'all get that? Okay. So, alternate universe number three, Sulu is the captain of the Enterprise. In this case, you have something that happens on a supply side of things. In this case, it increases. You open, now remember, we're talking Pepsi here. You open the newspaper tomorrow and you see that the price of Carbonated water is cheaper. Do you care? No. No. Do you know what it costs anyway? No. So as a consumer of Pepsi, that means nothing to you. But as a producer of Pepsi, does that mean something? Yeah. yeah. It means what? We can make our bottles cheaper. It costs us less per bottle to make, which means we can make more bottles it's the same for the same amount of money. Oh, okay, that's number three. <laughs> Keeping it count. It will allow us to make more. Yep. We're gonna take. I, I started to do two steps at once, and I'm gonna back up. So, what happens? They'll make more. And if they're making more, in order to get us to buy the more that they're making, what's gonna happen? They got to lower their price. 
Because otherwise, we're already drinking the amount that we're already wanting to drink at the price that we're drinking. So, uh, in order for us to drink more, they got to lower the price. In order to get Jamie to drink more Dr. Pepper than she does now, they got to lower the price because she's drinking all the Dr. Pepper that she wants to drink right now at the price that it is right now, right? So they have to lower the price. But they're also, we're okay with lowering the price because if it's easier for us to make a brown carbonated soda, it's going to be easier for somebody else to make a brown carbonated soda. And if we don't lower our price, we may be asking for competition. For somebody to come along with poopsy cola, I don't know, and they can come in, make it cheaper, and yeah, yeah, we keep saying, well, we've always sold it for a dollar a bottle, and that's all we're going to do, and they come along and sell it for ninety cents a bottle, and we lose half our customers. We can't take that risk. So, here's a dirty little secret in business: if you can lower your price, you will. You should. For most businesses, if you're in a competitive environment, if you're Tesla, you don't have to. If you're Apple, maybe you don't have to. But for most of us, if you can lower your price, you have to lower your price because otherwise, you're asking for some opportunist like Allison to come along and steal half the customers. And the easier it is, the new technologies that come out and that kind of stuff makes it easier for them to produce. That makes it more likely that somebody's going to come in and steal your customers unless you go ahead and adapt and, hey, 90 cents a soda bottle is better than no cents a soda bottle, so let's lower our price from a dollar down to 90 cents. If we're okay at only charging 90 cents because we're doing what? We're selling more of them, right? So maybe we're doing a little bit more work, but we're taking home the same amount of money. We're selling 30,000 bottles instead of 20,000 bottles, but the price we're selling for is a little bit less. Maybe we're bringing home the same amount of money when the dust settles, right? But if we leave the price alone, then Allison could come along and steal half of our customers, then we're really screwed, right? If you don't make it, then you're asking for somebody else to come along. I mean, don't make that much. Well, I think if you stay to 20, then there's going to be somebody that's going to be out there saying, hey, this stuff is cheap. It's cheap to make. Why in a crap? Why would you, let me do this. And there, your competition is going to come in. If they stay making it at the 20, even, well, they're not going to stay making 20 and then charging only 90 cents. They're going to be making 20 at a dollar. But then somebody's going to say, no matter what, how many Pepsi's trying to sell, Pepsi selling them for a dollar a piece. I can sell them for 90 cents a piece. I can survive doing that. People are going to come in to do that. Y'all would take a chance on a poopsie cola if it was 90 cents compared to a dollar, right? It's poop with a U, not a O. <laughs> Just how nasty do you think I am? But I mean, in all fairness, so, there, there already is like RC cola. Oh, oh, don't be talking back about RC cola. Anyway, just another I, way of feisty in the back. I was. I'm just saying, like, Good. RC yes. cola and Pepsi and Coke are kind of like. They're the same, not the same thing, sort of, but like, they're cola. Yes, yes. So, I mean, that kind of has already happened. You yes. Make poopsy cola. <laughs> yes. So, I, yeah, I could say, okay, our friends at RC. Yes. But, <laughs> RC cola and moon pie. There you go. That's your homework assignment for the night. For tomorrow morning's breakfast, RC cola and moon pie. That's your breakfast of <laughs> champion. That's your homework <laughs> When the price did, when, when something makes it easier to produce, you're going to produce more, which will let you sell more, but you're going to have to lower your price in order to A, let you sell that extra that you can now produce, and B, keep competition from coming in. But guess what? You and I as customers should love this. I get more Pepsi and each one is cheaper. Woohoo! We should love this. And what brings us about new technologies and that kind of stuff. So kind of dirty little secret is if it's life is easier for business, it ends up being easier for us as consumers. Now I see some of y'all packing up, but I still got like seven minutes. Now I'm gonna, I've got two more slides, so sorry. Scenario number four, alternate universe number four, check off as a captain of the Enterprise. Since the Star Trek movies, you know, they did the alternate universe thing. So okay, so this situation, bad news happens to Pepsi's ability to produce. Say the news comes out tomorrow saying that carbonated water is more expensive because the carbonated water plant 
the only plant on the East Coast that makes it just got devastated by the hurricane and it's going to be out of work for two years. So, do you as a customer, do you have a clue? Did y'all know that all the carbonated water in, on the East Coast is made in the plant in Wilmington? No, you didn't know. You don't care. It ain't a demand issue. It's just, it doesn't change the way you feel about Pepsi. Te Pepsi still tastes the same that it did before. Pepsi still, your income is still the same as it was before. But is, is that going to change Pepsi's ability to produce? Yeah. And is it going to make their job easier or harder? It's going to make it harder. They got to, instead of busting bottle, carbonated water a couple hundred miles from Wilmington, North Carolina, they got to bust it a couple thousand miles from somewhere in California, right? So they got to pay for extra trucks, extra truck drivers, pay overtime for the truck drivers, pay for the drugs that the truck drivers are using to stay awake on the highway. It's going to cost them more money. So what's going to happen? They're going to have to raise their price. And what happens when they raise their price? You and I as customers say, I'm not going to drink as much Pepsi because this stuff's got more expensive. So that's going to be the end result you get there. When it's harder for them to produce, they're going to have to raise their price and consequently, we're gonna buy less. All right. So, for those of you that are visual learners, we just had those last four slides. For those of you that are not visual learners, but you're good at memorizing stuff, see you learn it, know a little bit. This just summed up what happened on the last four slides. If demand increases, the quantity that we buy, or they sell, goes up, the price is gonna go up. If Demand decreases, well, then the amount that we're going to be buying is going to go down. The price is going to end up going down as well. If their supply goes up, it's easier for them to produce. Well, they're going to make more and the price is going to they go down. They get to lower the price. But if supply decreases, it's harder for them to produce. Well, they ain't going to make as much and prices are going to go up. So you can memorize these. Because I'm going to ask questions on a test like if the price of carbonated water goes up, what happens to the price of Pepsi? What happens to the number of Pepsi bottles sold? So that's the kind of question I'm going to ask. And if you can memorize and apply this, boom. If you can't memorize and apply this, you have two questions to ask. Question number one, is it a supply thing, is it a supply thing or a demand thing? Does it change the way we feel about the product as a customer? That would make it a demand issue. It, does it change their ability to produce? That would make it a supply issue. So first question, is it a supply or a demand thing? And then secondly, is it a good thing or a bad thing? If it's a good thing, you're gonna get an increase. If it's a bad thing, you're gonna get a decrease. So if it's something good for us consumers, well, demand is going to increase. If it's something bad for us consumers, demand is gonna decrease. If it's something good for the producers so they can do it easier, supply is gonna increase. If it's something bad for the producers, it's gonna make it harder for them, supply is gonna decrease. So if you can't memorize this or anything, you can look, it just add, ask yourself those two questions, is the supply thing or demand thing, and then is it good or bad? So then I'll tell you what curve to shift and which direction to shift it, and then I'll give you a blank supply and a demand curve that you can play with and you can start, start, start drawing lines on there. And I, okay, well, if I shift that one and it comes back, well, here's my new price, here's my new price, and you can figure it out. So you can maybe logic it out like, well, we're going to lower our price to keep our customers from going away for our demand is going down and they're leaving us. Or, you know, our costs increased in order to produce it, so we got to raise our price. So, you know, some of these things you can logically figure out. If you can't logically figure it out, you can memorize this. If you can't memorize it, you got supply and graph, supply and demand curve to draw on. So three different ways to come at the same answer on the test that is in four weeks. Yeah. Well, you know, on the second one, demand increase. If they lower the price, won't people gonna buy more? Well, not all, not all people. Some of well, them that's, see that that's that's the stopping the bleeding thing. People aren't as interested in our product anymore. They're not interested in typewriters or buggy whips or stuff like that anymore. So the only way we can get anybody to buy any of them is if the price is so stinking cheap. I mean, that's the nightmare scenario there. And that's what happens to your customers are losing interest. So you can lower your price to try to keep off, to try to stop all of them from going away. So that's what you get. Any questions? Okay. 
Well, um, I'll shut up and I'll let you go. And for those of you that did not get a midterm report, I will get one to you, whatever that day is, Thursday. Um, and 